Good morning, good morning, good morning, church. Yeah, hey, I like that. That's lively. That's, that's great. Since you guys were so lively, I'd like to do something with you. A little unscripted, but uh, we like to say things to Benjamin and then get Benjamin to say things back to us because he repeats everything. So if one of you cusses around my child, I will know because he will, he will tell on you when he says it at home. But I've been telling him to say, hey, I'll say, hey, Benjamin, give me an okie dokie. And then he goes, okie dokie. Um, and it just sounds so fun. So let's let's do that. Hey, church, give me an okie dokie. <laughs> That's awesome. That that warm, that that warms my heart. Listen, Sunday is my favorite day. It's my favorite day to be here. I get excited on Sunday mornings because I get to be here with you. And I just want you to know, especially if it's your first time being here, that it's an absolute honor to me that you'd give time out of your day, especially in a beautiful city like we live in. You could be on the beach or on the mountain, but you're here. And so I hope that you are able to take something away from today that makes your life better or that helps you to deal with the life that you have to step into on Monday morning or today or the next day. So as I look out into the audience, it's hard to miss my beautiful wife who's sitting here on the front row who's, who's pregnant. Our baby is due April 10th, and uh, we're hoping that it's not an Easter baby because I would like to be here with you guys. But when, when Casey got pregnant with Wyatt and when she was pregnant with Benjamin, as soon as, and women will understand this, as soon as, to, as soon as she got to the point in her pregnancy where she was unable to take medication because okay. it would mess with the baby, she got sick. And when you're pregnant and you get sick, you can't just take medicine because it, it could potentially mess with the growth of the development of the baby and then if you take like a if you take something and something you know the baby comes out and something's not right then the mom has all this guilt and all this stuff so so I, I here I am and in my home I've got my wife who's who's dying she's sick she can't take any medication this has happened twice and I look at her and I'm like why are you doing this like why 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 are you doing it? as if it's just her decision but it's why are you why do you want this? Especially the second time around, I'm like, you, you wanted this. This is on you, <laughs> not, on, not on me. But she hits me with this answer, and she says, this is a miracle happening in my body. It's an absolute miracle that life can come together and be created. And, and, you know, we all started as miracles. Every single one of you started as a miracle in your mother's womb. And, and we're born, and we're born into this world that we don't know, and the world doesn't know us. But we're born into this, this wonderful world, and we're going to get to know it as we grow. But as we're babies, we're just these innocent, little, wonderful miracles. But then as life goes on and as you grow, you start to encounter more of life, and life starts to encounter more of you. And you start to put things together, and you start to learn to reason, you start to learn to put logic to situations. Benjamin, he's starting to understand good guys and bad guys. So he constantly wants to know, is this a good guy, is this a bad guy? He's starting to understand how to manipulate babysitters. He's starting to understand all kinds of things about logic. But Benjamin is now, at almost three years old, he's experienced enough life, and life has experienced enough of him, that he's now able to interpret it and to interact with it more. And then even as you continue to grow from there, you start to experience more life, and more life starts to experience you. You start to maybe lose some of that beginning. You start to lose some of that innocence. You start to encounter things. You start to encounter people. Now, I remember when I married Casey Leifa, our oldest son, he's, he's 14 now, he looks like a 20 year old, but he's 14, and when I married him he was 7, and Casey and I used to often talk, we used to say like, it's so sweet to still see the innocence in Leifa, I mean he looked at the world through innocent eyes, and, and we look through our world through innocent eyes for a period of time. But what happens is, is as we continue to grow, as we continue to get older, we rub up against more of life, and more of life rubs up against us. And when that happens, we rub up against more relationships, and more relationships start to encounter us. And in fact, going through life is kind of like a boat through water. As the boat goes through water, you leave a wake behind you. So when you're young, when you're a baby, you're, you're, you're not even a boat. You're just like a, like a little leaf floating on top of the water. You leave no wake. As a three-year-old, 
you know, maybe you're like a little toy boat. You leave almost no wake. As you grow, maybe at some point you're a kayak or a canoe and you're leaving a little bit of a wake. And maybe in your 20s or 30s in your prime, you're like a speedboat just, you know, cruising through and you're leaving a huge wake. And when you get old and you get ready to die, you're like one of those ocean tankers and you're carrying, you know, containers worth of memories and you have this huge wake behind you. But when you look behind yourself and you look into that wake, what I think that we see the most is we see relationships. We see the relationships that we've had with people in our past. And what does it look like when you look over your shoulder? And you see the relationships in the wake behind you. Is it, does it look good? Does it look bad? Was it fun? Was it not fun? Is that we can't help but leave some kind of wake or some kind of legacy, that's another way you could look at it, behind you. So we have, we have this wake of legacy that we leave behind us. Relationships are this incredibly important thing, and it's this thing in life that we can't help but have, and we can't help but create, and we also can't help but be impacted by those relationships. And so, in this series, I, I kind of have an appeal for you, and then I also kind of have an apology to give you. But this series, we've been talking about, we've been talking about reassembling relationships, reassembling broken relationships. Now, broken relationships are hard. It's really easy for me to stand on stage and say, okay, this week, here's point number one. This is how you reassemble your broken relationships. Because I look out into the audience and I know a lot of you. I know a lot of your relationships and a lot of your problems because we pray for them. And as I'm up here preaching, I think, is this really helping them? Does this actually help you? And so I feel like maybe as I've done some soul searching, as I've looked within my heart, I, I want to say that maybe sometimes I can feel a little bit entitled that just because I preach it, you're going to apply it. Or just because I preach and teach it, it's going to change your life. But at the end of the day, it may not change your life. The one thing that can change your life is Jesus. But as Jesus is presented to you, you have to make a decision of, I actually want this to change my life. And so when I look at what my role is here, my role is not to change your life, but my role is to present for you a decision, a choice, and to present a scenario for you that you look at and you say, I want that. I want to choose for that to change my life. And so I want to acknowledge anyone that's been in here for the last three weeks who has said, I love what's being said, but my hurt is too much. This relationship is too broken. Yes, all this sounds wonderful, and I'm going to apply it to these relationships, but there's this one relationship over here that I am not going near, and I'm absolutely not going to apply it to. You know how I know that, that every single one of you have that relationship? Well, because I have it. I have relationships in my life that I say, but I'm going to apply all this stuff to it. And then, and then I look at some relationships and I think, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to touch that one. And so I don't want to be entitled as a church and, and as, as your pastor. I want to earnestly, from my heart, present to you my hope for you. See, my hope for you is not that this series changes your life. It's not that this series just solves all of your problems because it's not going to. My hope for you is that you come away from today and what we're going to talk about today and you come away knowing that there are things that you can do to make sure that when you get to the end of your life and you're looking in the wake behind you, you're able to look at those relationships that are behind you that you walked away and that, that you've left and you're able to look at them and say, I have no regrets. I did everything that I could for every relationship that I could. I pushed through the hard ones. I, 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 I dropped my pride for others. You know, I didn't do it perfectly on this one, but I circled back around years later and, and something good came out of it. But I want you to have no regrets. I can't expect you to just... I, I don't want to take away the weight of repairing a relationship from you. It's not a flippant thing to me. Because I realize... And this is me being fully transparent to you. I realize that it's an incredibly big ask for me to ask you 
to get over your problems in, in the hard relationships that you've had, because I know we've all been hurt by people, it's really, really, really a huge ask for me to ask you to just push through your pain and just adopt this. And I can put it into these beautiful bullet points and sell it to you and ready to go. It's a big ask. And I want you to know that I see it as a big ask. And so today, my, my message for you today is, is I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to make a decision. You get to make your own decision. I'm going to present to you four decisions, and you can decide, do I want to make it or do I not want to make it? But my hope is that I build a case for you that you will say, actually, you know what? I want to make this decision. And in order to, to bring some of that, that good that can come from relationships into the beginning of this message, I just I had a, a situation last week. I was able to do the wedding of, of Tim and Sam, and it was just absolutely beautiful. It was amazing. And I'll tell you, the most beautiful thing about that wedding, it wasn't the fact that it was 45 degrees out and that there were white chairs and it was in full sun. Where's the, where are they at? Yeah. That wasn't the most beautiful part of the wedding. What was the most beautiful part of the wedding is the reception. And it's not because it was in air conditioning. It was because they gave speeches. And the family members gave speeches, and it was wonderful, and it was beautiful. And then Tim stood up, and he gave a speech, and he thanked his dad, and he thanked his family. And it just, man, it hit me so hard. It moved me. And I thought, I, this is changing the way that I want to raise my kids. Because I want to raise my kids so that when they get married, they stand up and they give a speech that portrays this amazing, rich, good relationship. It was impactful, and it changed a lot about my aspirations. And I didn't expect to see that coming. But our relationships can be so good they can change our life completely. So I'm going to give you these four decisions and let you guys make the choice on whether or not you would like to make those. The first decision that we find is, is in this statement. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's getting back to, not getting back at. Getting back to, not getting back at. So what does this mean for those that are joining us for the first time? Getting back at somebody is, is what makes the world go around. It's what creates a good TV drama. It, it's what creates um, a good storyline in a book. It's the thing that creates tension. It, it's the way that the world works. This is, why we have, this is why we have rival gangs. Because one thing happens to one gang, and they have to get back at someone else, and then something happens there, and they have to get back at, at, at somebody else, and it's this horrible cycle. In fact, there's a really, really sad story in the States. It's about two families, and some of you may have heard of it. It's the Hatfields and the McCoys, and these two families, they lived on either side of a river with each other. So one was in Kentucky, one was in West Virginia, and there was a, a little river that went through it, and these two families hated each other. And after years of retaliation on each other, what ended up happening, one of the low points in the history of this, is, is on New Year's Day, the Hatfield family, they surrounded one of the McCoy family's cabins, and they opened fire on it because they were trying to chase the family out so that they could shoot them, including the kids. And they ended up setting that cabin on fire, and a lot of people died in that. That's so sad. This was such a, a famous rivalry that was built on getting back at each other. That they've made movies out of it. There's documentaries out of it. There's all of that stuff. But you know how it started? You know what started this whole thing? A pig. Seriously. The Hatfield family swore that a pig's ear was clipped to show that it was theirs. And the McCoy family swore that a pig's ear was clipped to show that it was theirs. A pig. A pig started a multi-generational uh, war because they were centered on I want to get back at this person and no, now I need to get back at this person so you get to make a decision do you want to continue to get back at the relationships do you want to trade pain for pain do you want to trade hurt for hurt do you want to trade justice for justice do you want to trade what you're owed for what they're owed or what they're owed for what you're owed you, you get to decide you get to decide whether or not you want to hold that or carry that or whether you want to let go of that and drop that. But what I hope that I can convince you to do is decide to get back to somebody. Now, I'm going to give you the model that Jesus gives us. Because I believe that Jesus created us. And if we were all made in the image of God, 
which is what we believe here in the church, if we were made in the image of God, that means that we were made to operate the way that God operates. And so we look at how does God operate? Well, when we were born, when, well, we'll go even back further from that. When Adam and Eve were created, they were, they were perfect. They were walking around naked in the Garden of Eden, enjoying life, you know, feeling a cool breeze, not too cold, not too hot, just wonderful. And sin was introduced, and they chose sin. They chose to make a decision that separated them from God. And so right then and there, God could have just canceled all of humanity, but He did not. In fact, the first thing He did after He cast them out of the garden was provided a sacrifice so that they could be brought into right standing with Him. And then all of the Old Testament, pick up your Bible, all of the Old Testament is about God coming after the, the people of Israel. That's what the whole thing is about. Craig, I can hear you, buddy. The whole Old Testament is about God coming after people. And then in the New Testament, you have Jesus. Jesus comes back, and Jesus, he steps in as this get back to. So God doesn't, he, God never wants to let go of people. He never wants to give up on people. And so he sends Jesus for us. So Jesus comes, and Jesus offers his life for us, a sacrifice for us. And then this allows us to have a relationship with Jesus. So here God and Jesus have created this model. So we've seen them model it with each other. We've seen them work it out, and we benefit from that. And so if that's the way that they work, if that's the way that they worked, and we were created in their image, then maybe it would work best for us if we adopted that method. Maybe if we stopped getting back at, because God didn't do this. God didn't get back at us. God did everything in his power to get back to us. And so we're going to see this in scripture here. I'm going to quickly walk you guys through this. Let's put John 3.17. So I want to show you. This is in, this is in the Bible. And, and, and this, is, this is just wonderful truth that can never be taken from you. If you choose Jesus, this can never be ever be taken from you because once it's done in your life it's done and it's sealed forever and so in verse 17 for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world so Jesus didn't come to condemn Jesus didn't come to get back at us instead but to save the world through him Jesus came so that God could get back to us we go on to the next verse I've got a couple to show you Verse 18 in 2 Corinthians 5. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So what that means is God sent Jesus to the world so that we were reconciled, which means fully restored. Which means fully restored to God's original plan for us, which is that we would be connected to him just like Adam and Eve were. Isn't that amazing? God didn't squash us and wipe us out. He sent his son to fully restore us. And then Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So what, what that means there is Christ then said, Hey, this amazing thing I did for you, what if you go out and you try and do it for others? What if you stop getting back at people and you try and get back to people? Next verse. Verse 19 it continues on and it says, That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Praise, hey, who's happy? You don't have to raise your hand because I'm going to assume it's everyone. Who's happy that our sins aren't printed and put on on the front of our t-shirt and we don't have to walk around having all of our sins counted against us? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise God about that. I'm glad that there's a God above that sent his son not to count our sins against us, but instead he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So guys, listen. You get to make the decision. Do you want to operate or do you want to try and operate in the model that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you were created to operate in? And if you want to try that, if you, just, you can try and you can fail and you can try and you can fail. But if you just keep trying to get back to people rather than getting back at people, we're promised in an unshakable word that this is the way that it works the best. And so the second decision that I want to give you a chance to make is a decision about taking ownership. Now, ownership is a really hard thing to do because that means that we have to drop our pride. 
And our pride is, is not always the thing that tells us, well, I'm amazing, I'm great. Uh, we have a joke in the office. Smiley walks around saying, I'm an apex predator. You know, I'm, I'm, and, and what that means is he's at the top of the food chain, and he's not being prideful, but it's, it's, a, it's a joke. But that's the way we think about pride often. But also what pride is, is pride is when we say, well, I, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve what I'm getting. No, you deserve to be wrong. You deserve to be punished. I don't deserve, I don't deserve that. You know, I, I, we don't even have enough time for me to go through my list of things where, where I'm prideful. But there's, there's one thing. We, we just did employee reviews here at, the, here at the church, and I got the opportunity to have all the elders review me. Now, doesn't that sound wonderful? Yeah. So I reviewed myself, and then they got the chance to review me. Now, I, I'll say that, that th- they were amazing. They gave me so much love and support. And if you're not familiar with our church, we are one of the rare few churches where I can raise my hand and say that our elders take such good care of us, and I'm so thankful for them. But one of the things that I put on my own evaluation is that I wanted to enter into meetings with less pride. Because sometimes, you know, when you have an agenda and somebody else says, well, you know, hang on, what about this? You can just naturally fill your pride well up and you can say, oh, no, well, hold on, I want my way. And so that, that's one of my goals for the year. And they're gracious enough to, to help me to learn to do that. But, but if we can just take our pride and set it aside and we can take ownership, which means we can say, it may not be my fault but I'm going to take ownership of what's wrong or what's bad in this relationship. Or you know what? I'm just going to own up that whether you accept your fault or you accept your responsibility, I'm going to go ahead and do something about what I can do in mine. And now again, Jesus, he models this perfectly for us. Jesus gives us the way that we can deal with taking ownership in relationships where you have been hurt in these relationships. And he paints this beautiful picture for us in Matthew 7. And Matthew 7 tells us this. They're going to put it up on the screen. There we go. Matthew 7, verse 1. So this is Jesus talking. If you're old school and you have a Bible with, uh, with red lettering, the red means Jesus is talking. And so in verse 1, Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So basically what Jesus is saying is, hey, the way that you treat others is the way that you're going to be treated. So careful, be careful how you do it because it's going to come back to you. And so Jesus goes on in verse 3, he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? And then he continues, And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time, that means you always, have a plank in your own eye. Now, what what Jesus is saying in this verse is he's saying, you're too worried about what other people are doing. You need to take ownership of what's happening in you. And, And this is the reason why Jesus says that. See, Jesus says there's sawdust in the other person's eye, but there's a plank in your eye. And what that means is that Jesus wants you to be the first priority. It means that your heart is the first priority. It means that he wants you to look inward at yourself before you look at others because he wants to deal with you in your heart. Jesus doesn't want to partner with you to deal with somebody else's heart because he's going to deal with them directly. Instead, Jesus wants to partner with you to deal with what's going on in your heart. So I like to think about this plank. As, as like a measure of priority. And so to me, that means that Jesus is saying, you are the priority. And then he goes on in the next verse, in verse 5, Jesus says, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Jesus is, is then encouraging them. I know it starts with a hard word, with hypocrite, but Jesus is offering to you some encouragement. If you deal with your heart, if you take ownership of your heart and your part, he's going to bring you into right standing so that you can then help others. This backs up the verses that we talked about at the beginning, where we go and do for others what Jesus has done for us. So when we deal with ourselves first, then we get to help others see more clearly. Let Jesus help you see clearly, and then you can use and go help others to see clearly. So with this, I have a question for you. I've got a couple of questions for you. So my question for you is, is this. And Karina's going to pop this on the screen for you. My question for you is this. Do you want a life 
where you take ownership of the plank in your eye. Or better yet, I could, I could ask it like this. Or better yet, do you want a life where the condition of your heart is the priority of Jesus? Or even better yet, do you want a life where you are the priority of Jesus? You know how to become the priority of Jesus? You just take ownership and you let go. You let Jesus work in you. And so now the third decision. We've got two more. Decision number three is this. I will make the first move regardless of who moved away first. Now this is, this is a hard one for us to do. Because if someone else moves away from you relationally first, it's easy to say, well, okay, well you stepped away, you're gone, fine, goodbye. But we want to have an open heart and we want, we want to be able to say, hey, regardless of who moved away first, I'm going to take a move towards you. Now this is one of those things that I recognize is a huge ask. Because a lot of people have made the move away from you relationally. It's a huge ask for me to say, hey, take the first step towards them. And the only thing that I can do is, is, is hopefully over the first two points, I've built a case for you, for you to be able to see that Jesus modeled life to happen in a certain way. And we were created in His image, so if we do it His way, then it will work out the best for us. If you're not doing it this way, if you choose not to do it the way we're talking about this morning, well, then you get to do it the way that millions of people continue to do it. And I would ask you this question, how's that working for you? How are you feeling? How is that relationship working for you? Or how is the lack of it working for you? In fact, for those of you that have had people step away from you first and you refuse to take a step towards them or acknowledge them, hey, are you, are you free? Are you free from hurt? No, no, no. It still hurts. It's still a painful thing. And so we've got to take a step towards them. Now Jesus gives us this teaching in Matthew. And it's this wonderful teaching. And it illustrates this perfectly. And we glaze over this, but I'll explain it to you. So he says, therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar. So imagine Jesus has got people around him and he's teaching this story. And he says, if you, all, if you offer a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave. So let me explain this to you. When you offered a gift at the altar, that meant that you maybe walked for days to get to this place. That meant that you maybe stood in line for hours and hours and hours to get your turn up at the altar. That means that, that you've put a massive amount of effort into getting there. It'd be like standing in line at clicks for the pharmacy and finally getting your number called. But right as soon as you get to the counter, you have to leave and, and not actually get served. And then you know you're going to get back in that line and spend the next nine hours there waiting to get served again. So what Jesus is saying here is, hey, you, you, I know that you've done so much work to get to the altar. And this sacrifice that he's talking about, where he, he says you're about to make a sacrifice. This isn't a sacrifice for your sin. This is a sacrifice of praise. So you've gone through all this trouble to get to the altar so that you can give Jesus, you can give God a sacrifice. It was God, not Jesus. But you can give God a sacrifice of praise. Aren't you wonderful? Aren't you so amazing? Here you are giving an extra sacrifice to God. And Jesus says, hey... If you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first. Go and be reconciled to them. There's that beautiful word, reconciled. Then come and offer your gift. Then get back in line at clicks. Yeah, I'd, Karina, you can go back a slide. You can pull the scripture back up. I was just thinking my last experience with clicks, and it froze me. <laughs> yeah. But God, God is illustrating this amazing priority for us. And what's interesting about this is the person at the altar is not the one that's done the wrong. The person at the, at the altar offering the sacrifice, they're having to go to someone that they know has beef with them. So this person is fine. They're living their life saying, I'm all good. I'm so good, I'm going to the altar. I'm so good, I'm going to make the journey, and I'm going to stand in line, and I'm going to take my sacrifice, and I'm going to walk up to the altar. My life is great. 
I'm so good, I'm going to give a, an offering of praise. I want everyone around me to see that, I'm, I, that my life is together and I'm happy. My family's good, everything's good, I've got a little extra cash, boom. Lay down an extra offering of praise for Jesus. And Jesus is telling us, hey, you may be good, but if you can think of somebody out there that's not good with you, then you need to drop the facade and you need to go and you need to make a step towards them. And then, once you've made that step, you can come back. And so the question I have for you is, is this. How many relationships hang on the thread of simply needing someone to take a step towards the other person? How many? Oh, I bet there's a ton. I, I, I bet so many relationships, more than, more than not. Where you have two people that are just saying, man, I wish that person would take a step towards me. Or, man, I wish that person would take a step towards me. You know, in, in my marriage with Casey, Casey is so wonderful at taking a step towards me. She doesn't wait. She doesn't hesitate. As soon as there's tension in our relationship, even when it's usually my fault, Casey will say, we cannot continue like this. And she will take a step towards me. Even if she's hurt, she'll say, I need to reach out to you. And it always leads us to a better place. So how many relationships in your life, or that you know, are literally just you dropping your pride and your hurt and taking one step towards that person in that relationship? I mean, you, you could be on the verge of just life change and relationship change with a bunch of people. And so the fourth decision, and this is our, our, our last decision, is I will keep the door open and the welcome mat out. I will keep the door open and the welcome mat out. With this decision is you're saying, I'm not going to close the door. I'm not going to close the door on any relationship. And not only am I not going to close the door, but I'm going to leave the welcome mat out. See, what a lot of us do is we maybe leave the door open, but then we booby trap the front of it. So, yeah, come on in. Yeah, yeah, okay, come back. Let's have a relationship. Yeah, it's, everything's good. You know, come on back in. And then they, they go, okay, great, this door's open. I'm going to walk through this door. And they walk through the door, and all of a sudden, they, boom, they hit one of your booby traps, and you just you nail them. And you hit them hard. That's what we do. We do it unintentionally. If you do that, all that is is that's, that's just you being hurt. That, that's all that it is. You're not a bad person. You're just a hurt person. And so the, the, the thing that I would ask you to do is open the door and then also put a welcome mat out and keep it there. It's not your job to make someone walk through it. But what you can do is you can leave it open. And my fear is that if you don't make this decision, then what happens is you close the door. And when you close the door, you become a prisoner. You build your own prison and you become a prisoner in it. You're a prisoner of your emotions. You're a prisoner of your hurt. You're a prisoner of your pain. And you put up walls like, I'm okay, everything's fine. But you, you become a prisoner. Or if you're like me, you become a master suppressor. You su just suppress all your emotions. Just keep shoving it down, shoving it down. And then eventually you have to deal with it and work on it. And it's like, whew, it would have been a whole lot easier if all those years I just left the door open and left the welcome mat out. And see, what happens when we get hurt is, is this. When a core relationship and your life breaks, then something core in us breaks. Let me read that to you again. Because th this is something that, that we've had in our families. This is something that we've had growing up. Remember when I started the message about the being born into the world when you're this little baby? You know, we're about to have another little baby. And I remember when Benjamin was born, and I, I saw this baby, and it was like, this baby doesn't know anything about this world. This baby doesn't have any, any interaction with this world. It is the most innocent that it could ever be in its entirety of life, is this moment. And, and we start out with just this beautiful innocence. You started out with beautiful innocence. And wherever you are today, just know that it, it's not all your fault. It's just a product of life. The world is full of broken people. Hurt people hurt more people. And this is such an important statement. When a core relationship breaks, something core in us breaks. 
to want a, a, a relationship with your parents or a relationship with your guardian or your family or a core friendship relationship or a core work relationship. But when something like that breaks, then something core in us, it, it breaks. And then what we do with that, if we don't leave the door open and the welcome mat out, we close all that up. And then you know what ends up happening when we close it up? We put ourselves in a prison. And then we sit there with our emotions. We sit there with, with, our, with our grief and with our hurt. And so to close this message out, I've, I've just got my, my final appeal for you. The, the last thing that I just want to ask you to do, the last decision that I would hope to ask you to make is, that, is I just I want you to recognize and say, hey, I'm with you guys. I'm walking beside you. And I'm recognizing that a lot of what we ask you to do with your relationships, especially when it comes to repairing them, it's a big ask. It's a big ask. It would be easier for me to go to a rich man and ask for a million rand than it is for me to go to a hurt man and ask him to take a step towards healing. It's a big ask. And my hope today is is to present you with some of these decisions because I just don't want you to have any regrets. I, I would hate for you to look back on life and say, man, I really regret that I didn't take that step, that I didn't get back to somebody, that I didn't take ownership, that I didn't take the first step. I just don't want you to walk away with that. And so I'm going to pray for us. And, and as I pray, I'm just going to ask God. And so this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to pray and ask God to reveal to you some relationships and then also for God to reveal to you maybe some of these decisions that you can make towards those relationships. And I'm going to pray and ask God that something breaks off in you and that you are freed up so that you can make one of these decisions to help repair and reassemble one of these broken relationships. So dear Jesus, Father, we come to you.